Where's Rich? We're like, okay, me and you, turkey leg. Okay. Uh, so today we are going to be talking about untriggering doubt. Now I changed. Whoa, come on, come on back, Jesus. There we go. Okay. I've changed the title from um, untriggering unbelief to untriggering doubt because I think a lot of us equate unbelief to not being a believer. And we are, most of us here, we're believers in Christ. Amen? Uh, we, we, we know Christ. We know what he did for us. We receive him as our Lord and Savior. We're not uh, needing to be convinced of his, his power and his promises, but yet we still struggle with doubt. Doubt is that annoying, nagging part of our faith that just kind of sometimes keeps us up at night because it's like we should be longer or, or, or better in our faith. We, sh we shouldn't have these issues of doubt. And I would say it's one of the most frustrating things we can deal with as believers is dealing with doubt. Say doubt. It's, it's like having a sliver, an embedded sliver in your foot. When you're, when you're walking and you get that sensation of the sliver, what do you do? You, you bend down and you, okay, all right. How are we doing this, guys? Is this going to be on, off? What do we do? Oh, there we go. Okay. So if this happens again, I'm still here. Just say amen so I know you're still there. All right. But what we do is when we have the sliver, we, we bend down, we look at our foot, we take our socks off, we feel the bottom of our feet, right, to try to feel that sliver, but we can't find it because it's embedded. And when we rub our fingers on our foot, we don't get that same sensation, do we? But then we put our sock back on, our shoe back on, we start walking again, and what happens? We feel the sliver. Why? Because it doesn't manifest until the full weight of our body rests on it, doesn't it? In the same way, this is what happens to doubt. This is why we doubt in our faith. We think we're doing great, but all of a sudden, when the full weight of the circumstance we're struggling with is on it, that's when doubt starts to sprout. Amen? So we have to learn how to deal with it. We do not want to be in a perpetual state of doubting, do we? Because what that does is that slows down our faith and we start losing the opportunities God, God has for us. I, I want to challenge you because doubt is one of those things that we can't deal with it in a physical manner. We have to deal with it in a spiritual manner. It requires, listen to me closely, it requires spiritual confidence. Oftentimes we try to deal with it in a, in a physical way, and it just doesn't work. And it doesn't matter what we're talking about as it relates to doubt. You may be doubting, does they really care about me? Do they really love me? Is someone cheating on me? Is, are, are they trying to get rid of me? Is, am, am I not good enough for the job? Am I not smart enough for the job or for what, what I'm going through? Is, is my health not good enough to make it? Is it, do I not have enough money to, to get past? Do I not have the faith to, to, to keep going strong? Am I going to go back to where I once was? And many think, like I said, the remedy of this is self-confidence. If I'm more self-confident, if I have more understanding of the situation, then doubt will be removed. And we've known that these tricks of our flesh just don't uh, feed doubt. The more knowledge we get, the, we think the less doubt we'll have. Even if we know the truth, right? Even, hey, even if I know re the truth, regardless of, what, regardless of what it is, at least I won't doubt anymore. Or, or we think, or if I'm praised enough, or I get people to like me enough, or I have enough money or self-confidence, then, then what it, 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 it'll dissipate. Or maybe the thought is, um, if I just don't care about the income uh, outcome, if I don't care about what happens, if I don't have any high expectations, if I just like dumb it down, lay it down, then you know what? I'm not going to doubt because I don't have to doubt because I'm not really expecting anything. You know, my dog doesn't have a care in the world. 
when you see Coco, I mean, she just, she's a chill dog. And she just, just lays back on her back and just relaxes most of the day until she knows we're about ready to leave the house. And then all of a sudden, she freaks out. I mean, it's the craziest thing. It's like we don't say anything. We don't even talk about going. It's like we've, we've already talked to each other. It's like when we're about ready to go, we don't say anything until we put her in the garage because she'll run and hide. And she does it all the time. It's like, where's Coco? She's hiding. Well, what did you say? I didn't say anything. I don't even take the keys and jingle the keys or put the keys in my pocket because I know the moment I do, she runs and she hides. The other day, we were looking for, for like five minutes and finally we found her in this corner she's never been in. Why? Because she has this fear of, 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 of us leaving. And we try to do all these sorts of tricks, but it doesn't work, work with her. In the same way, you cannot trick your flesh into doubting. Did you hear me? You can't trick your flesh because it's a spiritual thing. It's not a physical thing. It requires... Uh, to combat it with spiritual confidence. The devil, the devil doesn't care how many ducks you have in a row, how many well-conceived plans you have. He doesn't care about how much confidence you have in your money or your position or whatever you have. That doesn't threaten him to throw doubt your way. Why? Because he recognizes it's a spiritual thing. I look at how Jesus was tempted in Matthew chapter Four, Jesus was tempted to doubt his calling. And so what you see is Jesus, he knows who he is. Can I get an amen? Jesus knew he was the son of God. He knew his father in heaven. He knew the plan. He knew everything. And yet the devil tried to tempt him to doubt the cross. Paraphrase, you don't, gotta go, you don't have to go to the cross. Hey, just listen, I'll give you some ways to make people believe in you without going to the cross. But how many know the devil just left out the part that we needed the blood? Can I get an amen? We need the blood. We need his redemptive power through the blood of Jesus. He had to go through the cross. He wasn't buying into this doubt. Like the scripture says this. Listen to these words in James 1, 6 through 8. For he who doubts is what? Come on, let's read it together. For he who doubts is what? Like a wave of the sea driven and what? Tossed by this, the wind. For let not the man suppose that he will what? Receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable in all of his ways. See, the enemy knows that when it comes to your faith, most of us are pretty secure in our faith. We love Jesus. We recognize that Jesus died for our sins. We've asked him to come into our life. He's the Lord and Savior. That's for the most part a done deal. But the enemy just doesn't go after that. He goes after the second best thing, which is our calling. He tries to attack our influence. Why? Because he knows if he has our influence, then we're not going to bring anyone else into the kingdom, right? Right? So he taxes us with all this worry and this doubt till we're chasing our tail and then we're so confused and bound with worry and doubt that we're no earthly good for anyone. Can I get an amen? So, so this is what he does. And how does he do it? Well, all he has to do is slow us down when it comes to the things of God. Slow you down. Mike, if I can get you to double guess and to second guess and, 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 and when I'm giving you a, a, a directive, when the Lord's giving you a directive or reaching out to a friend, if I could just slow you down long enough, you're going to miss that divine appointment. You're going to miss that opportunity. And then all of a sudden, what happens is we've let, let debt, just, uh, doubt just consume our minds to the point that we're missing out on the things of God. And I want us to see here that Jesus has a remedy for this. God has a remedy for this. And it's found in one of the most uh, quoted scriptures in the Bible. Let's look at Luke chapter 18 verses 16. Luke chapter 18 verses 16. It says, let the little children come to me. And do not what? 
forbid them for what? Such is the kingdom of God. When I Googled this verse, what, what I did is I, I, I went to the images and I started looking at these images. Let's go to that, that image. And, and, and uh, if we can go to that image, guys. All right. Now. There we go. Look at that. Well, that's power right there. Anyways, but this is the kind of images that were coming up on, on Google. Uh, it, was, it was all about Jesus just embracing kids. He was kneeling down and kids were running uh, into his embraced arms and, and they were feeling the, 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 that, 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 that just love and the acceptance and they were running in and, and, and they're great renditions. They're great, beautiful pictures of this. But the reality is this is the wrong interpretation. Not just uh, the, the wrong image, but the wrong interpretation. It's taken out of context. And, and when I reread this verse in its context, all of a sudden this image that we draw the interpretations, God love is so great that it's just going to just wipe out all the fear that's in our life. It's a great thought, but it's the wrong interpretation. So let me read to you this in context in Luke chapter 18, 15 through 17. And as I read this, I think it's going to conjure up a little different image in your mind. So let me read this and you can follow along. It says, in verse 15, then they also brought infants to him. Say infants. That he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him and said, let the little children come to me. And do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. As surely I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it see as you can see it's a little different picture isn't it these children are not running into the arms of jesus rather they are infants in the arms of their parents and jesus is anointing them on the head so they, obviously this is a little different thing here and 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 let's just be real kids Kids struggle with running into the arms of strangers. Can I get an amen? I mean, let's be real. All of us have been at that age maybe where, where you know, your first encounter was Santa. You know, the fake one. And uh, at, when I was five years old, I, 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 was, I, I, I sat on his lap. And the only reason I sat on his lap was everyone else was sitting on his lap. And, and I didn't want to miss out. And I wanted the gift, which, you know... That was, you're supposed to do that. But, but the reality is that I had some apprehension here. And then Jesus, when you think of Jesus, he didn't come with a, a, a Santa suit on. He didn't have an aura about him that this is what you're supposed to do. This was a guy that came in and yes, the parents knew him. The parent, he was performing all sorts of miracles. They were excited about him. But these little infants, they didn't have, they didn't have a clue. They didn't need him. Did you hear that? They didn't need him. They were comforted in their mother or father's arms. They were cool with breastfeeding at that point. If I could be a little uh, real with you. They were cool with pooping in their mom and dad's arms. They were cool with just hanging out with their mom and dad. And so when you look and you start to explore this first, you realize, wait a second, what's going on? Jesus, don't you think you should have a better analogy of faith than just having some infants that are disinterested in you as being the pinnacle of faith? This doesn't make sense. It's, counter, it's counterproductive, isn't it? But then you take a step back from this and you start looking at it in the way that he wants you to look at it. And you realize that, wait a second, what he said and what he actually did makes sense when it comes to our faith. See, Jesus wasn't equating the belief that we have in him to how infants welcomed him or how they ran into his arms. 
He was equating faith to how the infants were responding to their parents. He was looking at the infants in their parents' arms. In their full comfort. In their full uh, confidence. Being in their parents' arms. And said, if you don't receive the kingdom of God like this. You're not going to enter it. So, so now we see it starting to unfold here. And what is the kingdom of God he's talking about? It's every temporal and eternal blessing God has for us in Christ Jesus. Amen. It's our salvation. It's our wholeness. It's our restoration. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the gifts of God. It's everything that he has for us. The wisdom of God. It's all of it. And he's saying great promises. But listen. The only way you can experience it is if you have faith like one of these infants. If you have a trust in me as these infants have a trust in their parents. Do you see it now? God wants us to open this up. He wants us to identify what's going on here. See, you might be saying, well, pastor, I... I I don't know about that type of faith because I have a little different type of way I process. I, I, I'm a, a little less blind faith and more reason. I, I, I like that kind of faith. Well, you may like that kind of faith and you have a right to believe the way you want to believe. But you do not have a right to attach reward to it. Amen. Reward comes from God. You can't attach your own reward to your own faith. You attach God's reward to his faith. The kind of faith he's asking. You can believe in your abilities and determination and self uh, well conceived plans. But none of these have the power to deliver you from doubt. None of these have the power to de deliver results. Doesn't matter how confident or how reasonable it sounds let, let, let me give you this scripture found in 1 Corinthians 3 10 through 13 let each one take heed on how he builds it on it he's talking about faith for none other for no other foundation can anyone lay than which is laid which is Jesus Christ now if anyone builds on this Foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. Each one's work will become clear for the day will re declare it. Because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's works of what sort it is. Listen, there's only one kind of faith. There's only one kind of faith that produces results. That produces kingdom. That, that, that just causes doubt. To flee, and that is the kind of faith that was demonstrated with an infant and their parent. He's saying, just, just look at this. Look at this bond here. Take a step back and look at this bond of trust. Because when you see it, you're gonna have a you're gonna have a vision of what I'm asking you to do. My hope is when we're done with this. I, I really believe that not only are we going to be untriggered from consistently doubting. And I think that's the operative word, consistently, because it, it's not a foolproof way. Because doubt comes, right? Doubt is an attack by the devil. We all get that, those thoughts of doubt. They just pop in our mind. But then dwelling on them and meditating on them and being in a consistency of doubting, we need to break off. Can I get an amen? Our faith needs to go to another level. So what is this belief that infants possess? What, what, we need to discover it. Well, it's less of a, of a formal belief and more of a general trust. Infants technically haven't believed anything yet. There's no theory principle that they've articulated and then they conceived and, and now they're, they're believing. No, it's, it's as simple as this. They simply feed or draw off of what their parents give them. And they're okay with that. Say okay. Have you ever seen an infant wrestle with being an infant? 
No, you, you never know, you're not going to see that. Oh, oh gosh, I better not breastfeed. Because someone's looking at me right now. No, that's the opposite. It's like, where is it? Damn it. Right? But they're not thinking to themselves, oh my gosh, I better not cry. Better not cry. Better be contained here. I don't want people to think that I can't manage this situation. Ah! Whatever, whatever need they have, they cry out. Babies don't think this way. When they have a need, they just cry. They cry for it. Do you think a baby stops crying when they don't get what they want? No, they keep on crying until they get it. Babies aren't thinking, I wonder if mom and dad really want to give it to me. No, they don't care about that. They're going to cry until they get it. Why? Because there's something inside of them that has a trust. They have a trust. There's a trust that has been formed between them and their, 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 their parents that they know they got the deed. They got the goods. Amen? They know they have it. In the same way, God has designed us to be like that. Designed us to go after what the creator has for us. Let, let me give you a scripture as it relates to that. Matthew 6, 27 through 30. Look at the birds of the air. Have you ever noticed them? I know Carol has. <laughs> for they neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. And are you not more valuable than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet what? I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30, now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Can I get an amen? It's natural. It's very natural. This is what God, this is the bond of trust God created in our spirit Why we were in our mother's womb. So why, it? what happened? What happened to us? Why did we stop, why did we start doubting more than we stopped, than we started crying for, out for things? Asking for things. Wondering if God really loves us, if he has our best interest in mind, if he really has the power to do what he says he can do. I want us to look at this verse together in Matthew 7, 7, 11. This is God's cry out to us. This is, he's trying to get us back to our identity in him. He's trying to get us back to how he destined us to be. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread will he what? Come on let's all give him a what? A stone. Or, if, or he asks for a fish will he what? Give him a serpent. If you then being evil meaning less than God, loving, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? See, doubting only happens when we stop asking. It's only when we stop praying. You can't do both. They offset one another. You try doubting at the same time of praying, it just doesn't work. One will offset the other. And God's saying, no, 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 no. I created you to be like infants, to cry. To cry out when you need something. Not to doubt when you need something. So why are babies so quick at crying? Why do they are so quick? Why do they just quickly just move into that mode of crying for something? Say proximity. Psychologists have determined that the nine months in the womb has established a trust between the child and the mother. 
And this, is, this contributes to their crying because they know if I cry long enough, the source is there. They're not doubting the source. That's why they're crying out for it. I cry a lot. Hey, the source is around. <laughs> I, I know this because I have this bond of trust. Say proximity, closeness. This is what God is going after. This is the secret to crying, to asking instead of doubting. I'll never forget when Kyra and I were just starting to date and we were going to church together in Rockwall, Texas at a place called Church on the Rock. And I would pick her up from her dorm at school and it was Mary Martha, it was a woman's dorm and I couldn't technically go on campus because it was the ladies. So uh, anyways, I, I, I would always park over in this and Kyra would come out to get me, come out to the car at around 6.30 in the morning. We had to leave early to get the first service so we could be back in time to go to one of the services at the school. And it was working great for about a month. And I would come by Mary Martha dorm and there she was and we would get in the car and we'd head on the church. But this particular Sunday I went out there and crickets. She's not there. And I know where her apartment was. I knew the number. I knew where it was. Uh, not because I looked in it. No, no. I mean, I, it was because, <laughs> no, it was because I, I just knew where it was. And it was dark, so I knew she had forgotten about the time. Or the alarm didn't go off or something. And so I started throwing little rocks at her window. Until there were no more little rocks. And then there's just big, big, big rocks. And I decided not to throw those. And so I'm waiting for several minutes. And then I see a lady across the street. She's at this park having her quiet time. And I come over to her. I said, ma'am, if you don't mind, my girlfriend's in, uh, in this apartment here. Here's her number. Do you mind just knocking on the door? That's all you have to do. And sure enough, she said, yeah, okay, I'll do it. So, so she goes, she knocks on the door, and within a few seconds, all of a sudden, the lights just turn on. And I knew Kyra was ready, going for it. And in 10 minutes, she was out of the door. Church, that record has never been beat yet. <laughs> Say proximity. Knowing where someone is and knowing that you have the ability to get to that someone gives you hope. It gives you hope to, that you can reach them. The fact that I could see her apartment, that I knew she was in there, gave me hope that if I kept trying, I could reach her. It's like anything we else we do in life isn't it when we get close enough to it we don't want to give up amen we don't want to give up who wants to quit a job when you have six months left to full retirement <laughs> I said this in the first one let's try it again who wants to after you've been on the treadmill for almost 30 minutes the last minute give up on the treadmill uh, yeah okay <clears throat> Who wants to give up on a test when you have just one question left on the test? Let me, let me give you this first. And I want you to think about this. John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Do you know what the secret to faith is? The secret to not... Doubting is, it's found in proximity. It's found in closeness. As you spend time with the Lord, the closeness of that relationship starts to dispel doubt. Starts to break it down. It starts to uh, break off fear and worry. Let, let me give you another verse, James 4, 8. It says, draw near to God in what? He will draw near to you. This verse used to bother me. 
Because it didn't make sense. I mean, God's always been the initiator in our relationship. Can I get an amen? Be before I was a committed Christian, he, he knew me. He demonstrated his love on me while I was yet a sinner. So how can we start out in grace and then this verse make it, makes it sound like we have to end in works? It wasn't until I realized, until the Holy Spirit revealed what James was talking about. James was not saying God is waiting for us to draw near. Rather, he is saying as we spend time in his presence, we will realize how close he's always been. How close he's always been. But it doesn't happen until we have the moments of proximity, closeness. When we come into his presence and when we meditate on his greatness and his love, all of a sudden we get this feeling of his presence. And it's just not something that we can, we can experience physically but eternally. Internally and 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 all of a sudden things start to break down It starts to untrigger that doubt How do you untrigger doubt well very simple if I could have the worship team come ahead Very simple number one spend time Spend quality time in his presence Boy when you know he's close you're not afraid to call out his name. You're not afraid. You're not worried. You're, it, it, babies cry out because they know the mom is near. In the same way, when we come into his presence, we get that feeling of his nearness. And we're not afraid to say, Jesus, I need your help. I need your help. I can't do it without you. Visit www.harvestvalley.org for more details and information.